gentlemen, live from the famous Acme Comedy Theater in Hollywood, this is the Acme Radio Hour featuring the Liquid Radio Players. And now, please welcome to the stage, Brian St. Brighter. Yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good night. Our show is canceled. Goodbye. Well, I, it's an unfortunate thing, but our scripts were lost on the way to the theater, and we have no show for you. What? Someone wants us to make it up as we go along? To improvisize? Well, if you insist, we were going to do a mystery show for you tonight. And in order to do that, we'll need a title of a mystery show. So, can I have a title of a mystery show that's never been done? The Dark Corner. The Dark Corner. The mystery of the Dark Corner. That's brilliant. And what's your name, young lady? Jessica. Jessica, and what street did you grow up on? Jessica Reseda will have to be one of our characters in tonight's show. Yes, and, and you over there, young lady, the beautiful woman, do you have a favorite, well, you could fight over it. Do you have a favorite Chinese food? Um, uh, General Chow's chicken. General Chow. All right, General Chow will be one of our characters tonight. And uh, yes, yes, you, young lady with the lovely blonde hair. Um, can you give me a, a man's name that you remember? Dean. Dean, and uh, uh, one of your childhood teachers, or last name? Uh, Carter. Uh, Dean Carter. Love Mr. Yes, yes, of course. And uh, you, sir, can I have a foreign sounding name? Juan. Juan, and, uh, and uh, yes, uh, a street maybe that you grew up on or knew. Juan Jardidas. Jardidas. Jardidas? Yeah, spell it like it sounds. Sir. <laughs> and how many do we have there, Mr. Hobbick? Uh, one, two, three, four. All right, and uh, you, young lady, lovely young lady, um, do you remember uh, your uncle's name? Uh, Tony. Tony, and uh, do you have a favorite kind of food? Food. Uh, chicken Tony Mole, Tony Mole, yes, Tony Mole. And uh, yes, that that sounds great. And could somebody just shout out? Did anyone have a sibling? Just shout out a sibling's name, a brother. I'm uh, sorry, Mark. 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 And uh, yes, very good. And uh, what's the kind of car did your father drive? Uh, First car, old car. Uh, car. Uh, Mark Star, Mark Star, yes. Mark. Yes, and now, does anybody have any product that they used in the last week? Product around the house, in the kitchen, that you recall using? Hairspray. Hairspray. And, uh, and uh, what's your last name? Castilian Hairspray. Castilian Hairspray, yes. Yes, and uh, is, there, is there a service that you uh, used in the past? Any kind of service? A gym. A, a gymnasium? Yes. And uh, what's uh, your first grade teacher's name? Lads. Lads Gymnasium. <laughs> and finally, um, what's your least favorite type of cigarette? Anyone? Marlboro. Marlboro cigarettes. All right, might as well give them a plug. All right, very good. So uh, well, let's recap our, our show, the, the Dark Corner. Mystery of the Dark Corner, Jessica Reseda, General Chow, Dean Carter, Juan Jardidas, Tony Mole, and Mark Starr. Tonight's show is brought to you by Castilian Hairspray, Lads Gymnasium, and Marlboro Cigarettes. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the Liquid Radio Player. <laughs>
by their very own mouths and minds. Ladies and gentlemen, there in Radio Land, consult your journal entries from last week's mystery. And look at the answers that were provided to you at the end of the show. Mayonnaise, bicycle tire, and juju bee. That's right. And our winner from last week's show, Johnny Telmanson. Yes. Yes, Johnny Kelmanson has won a decoder ring, a general chow decoder ring. Submit your answers to this week's show and see if you can win a prize. Perhaps a package of Marlboro cigarettes for your favorite son or daughter. Now, as our scripts are being handed out, I'd like to you to imagine the sound of a steaming locomotive traveling through a tunnel. Big over here. <laughs> and on that train, a junk gunshot has gone off. And the scream hey, of a man who's just been shot. Oh! No, that wasn't a real man. That was Brian Hobbick, our Foley artist. Allow him to escape you into fantasy. Escape and our music tonight is, of course, by Jonathan Green and his 88 <laughs> And yes, I've just been given the finger by Mr. Hobbit. We are about to go on the air in three, two... Who's that? Why, you're here right on time. Open the door and come into my chamber. Wait a minute, it's locked. Allow me to unlock it. There we are. Why, you look tired. Have a seat. That's right. Make yourself comfortable. Here, here's a brandy. I'll pour it for you. You look thirsty. Now, sit and relax while you hear the tale of mystery, the mystery of the dark corner. Don't mind the storm outside. Maybe you should mind it. It sounds pretty nasty. But as the clock stops ticking, Listen to the sound of my voice taking you to mysterious places. Mysterious places guided by General Chow and his oriental ways of mystery. Tonight, General Chow is played by David Cox. General Chow from the farthest east across the Pacific Ocean, areas like China and other Asian places. He always wore a long red silk robe and his top knot, which hung low, allowed him <laughs> to access the countless ages of mysticism, to allow him to solve mysteries left unsolved for many years. General Chow was not paid. No, he solved mysteries <laughs> for the love of solving them. His mystic bag was all he carried with him, which had mystical items that allowed him to solve mysteries. General Chow. <laughs> and of course, Dean Carter, played by Brian Giovanni. Dean Carter, a 13-year-old boy who was adopted by General Chow as a result of a horrific train accident where he was found by General oh, Chow oh my God. and made his war. Yes, he was a bright boy and had a penchant for mysteries himself. 
He would often accompany General Chow on many adventures and would often lend his boyish ideas to help solve mysteries. Would he be able to lend a hand this time? I'm sure he would, or he wouldn't be in this story. That's right, Dean Carter. And of course, Swan Jardidas, played by Michael Perkins. Suave, dark, tall, handsome, mysterious, Juan Jardidas. That's all we need to know about him. And of course, Tony Moley, played by Paul Hungerford. A two-bit thief who made his way around the streets of San Francisco. If you needed to know something or needed to find something or needed to find someone who took something from someone somewhere, why, you'd usually look for Tony Moley. He had a sharp tongue and usually had his hand sticking out for a donation would buy some information. Tony Moley. And of course, Mark Starr, also played by Michael Perkins. Mark Starr was a very wealthy man who lived on Knob Hill. He owned most of San Francisco's garment district in Chinatown, and he ruled it with an iron fist covered in a silk glove that he made off the sweat of Chinamen that he cast aside like dirty tissue paper. That's right, Mark Starr. And of course, the most beautiful one for last, Jessica Reseda played by Susan Peel. <laughs> Jessica Reseda was a dressmaker who had moved into San Francisco with a dream of one day opening a large factory and sharing her designs with American beautiful women. Yes, her designs. She was kind and loving and beautiful and vulnerable and lonely and a victim a victim of mystery in tonight's show, The Mystery of the Dark Corner, brought to you by Castilian Hairspray, Lads Gymnasium, and Marlboro Cigarettes. Thank you, Susan Peel. Oh. And now our cast has got their scripts and they're ready to begin. Are you still sitting in that chair? Are you enjoying your brandy? Yes, have a Marlboro cigarette. Ah, yes, taste the cool smoke as it fills your lungs, cleaning them with the way Marlboro cigarettes do. Ah. Now, imagine yourself on the busy streets of San Francisco, Van Ness Boulevard that crosses Lombardo Street. We hear the clang, clang, clang of the trolley car. Hey, don't nobody. Hey, watch it, mister. Oh, yes. Okay. It passes the wall. Passes the wall. Past Little Italy. Hey, who's the one being a pizza pie? Into Chinatown, where it abruptly comes to a stop. And a very tall passenger draped in a red silk robe steps down from the trolley car with a boy with bobby socks next to him. General Chow is taking Dean Carter to San Francisco to show him where his ancestors toiled. Yes, you see, before I was the cultured gentleman you see before you, my family worked many years serving here in San Francisco. Gosh, General Chow, your family has such a long and storied history. Yes, my father was a sculptor. My mother, 
She'd make a very fine jewelry and embroidery. They serve day after day to make a fine artwork. Wow. They briefly went over last week's mystery and how General Chow was able to solve it with so few clues. I can't imagine how fast you detected who stole that painting from the Vatican yesterday. Yes. Well, you saw that guy with the green eyes? Well, sure. It was him. <laughs> and you figured that out just by looking at his necktie? Yes. For only a man with a left hand could tie that knot so easily. And as you know, left-handed people, evil. Oh. Suddenly, as they were walking down the streets of Chinatown in the garment area, they heard the sobbing of a poor woman from inside a store. She was putting a going out of business sign up. Oh. Well, say, General, you hear that? Yes, I do, Dina Carter. He's a cry of a woman. What can you tell me about her? Just from the sound of her crying. Hmm. The slight dialect of the higher decibels of her weeping suggests she is of European descent. Yes. Hmm. Number two. Okay. Also, the sonic waves emitted by the sound suggest she is sweating precisely under her left cheek. Yes, that's a moist cry. And the third thing, which is should be obvious, even to two children? She clearly isn't married, for only an old maid would cry so despondently. Yes! <laughs> this is a woman who has never known the soft, gentle touch of a man teaching her how to be quiet. And with that, they approach the building, a building placed in a dark corner of the street. Excuse me, beautiful lady. We do not wish to intrude on your grief, but we could not help but notice you're grieving. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I that loud? I, I am going out of business, you see, and so if you'd like to be my very last customers, I'd be most honored. She invited them into her dress shop and told them to excuse the mess as she was packing it all up. Yes, I just have a few more things to put in these boxes, and I, they're so heavy to lift. If only I had some help. Oh, I'll help you, miss. You're a kind boy. And with that, Dean Carter lifted the boxes and took them to the back of the store, leaving General Chow and Miss Reseda alone. There was a newspaper that showed that several dressmakers in that area had been killed. The very dressmakers that worked in her store, hmm. mysteriously see, I... dying of a mysterious way. I don't know how this has been happening. I show up to work in the morning and there's... There's threatening notes taped to the door and actually nailed to the door and, and then sometimes there's a strange sort of blood on the door and I have to scrub it off so that the customers don't see it and sooner or later the customers just stop coming. She handed two of the notes to General Chow. Hmm, I see. Go away or someone else will be killed. <laughs> no milk delivery on Thursday. Those were important clues to him. We hear his innermost thoughts. Hmm. No milk delivery on the Thursday. But the milk always come on a Thursday. Otherwise, how can we bake a cake for weekend party? Also, someone obviously wants her to leave. Otherwise, why threaten her? And this blood, it is strange. Not a human blood at all. Just at that moment, Dean came back into the room. He looked nervous, as though he had found something, but didn't want to bring any attention to Miss Reseda. All the boxes are stored away like you asked. Oh, you're a very kind boy. Here, uh, I'll just reach into my pocket. I, I think I have a dime for you. And she reached into her pocket. She pulled out a red silk piece of cloth and quickly put it in another pocket and oh, then I pulled out a dime. Oh, here we are. Uh, in my left pocket. I always keep my change in my dominant oh, pocket. I see. Uh, oh, I have a sneeze. And the mucus oh. is now in my very long, wispy mustache. Oh, yes, and my. as the mucus dripped down his long, hanging mustache, past the long, pointy beard that hung from his chin, Miss Reseda pulled out a different handkerchief. 
Here, please, and, and you can hold on to this. Uh, you might notice the fine embroidery and the blind stitching on the edges. I, I did this as a young girl. Oh, just like my mother used to stitch. It is too nice to take from you. I must insist you give me that uh, scrappy red handkerchief I saw you put in your other pocket. Oh, no, that, that one's dirty. You don't want that one. I, I couldn't. And do I detect a slight Italian accent? Was your mother Italian? <laughs> Miss Resina made a hasty excuse and demanded the two leave the store. I, I'm very sorry. I, I'm expecting the movers to come here shortly. I, I, I'm going to have to do a few things before I lock up. You'll, you'll have to go, but thank you so much for your help. She hurried the two out and left them on the street in front of the store. She was very anxious to get rid of us, was she not? Yes, and even all too anxious to keep that one embroidered piece of garment. Yes. Just at that moment, a tall, dashing, European-looking man came out of a neighboring dress shop he was carrying a package, and he looked like he didn't want to speak to anyone and bumped right into the rear of General Chow. Oh! Watch it. Please, pardon me. Ah, what a very interesting accent you have for Chinatown. <laughs> what, is a man not allowed to go into the part of town that does not contain his ethnicity? No. For it is said a man who wanders where he is not wanted often find things he does. General Chow quickly what? interrogated the man to find out certain details, to find out where and why he was there. I am curious why you would come to in front of this particular uh, dress shop. Are you shopping for fiancé or mother? It is not against the law for a man to buy a dress, is it? No. I suppose or not. I was uh, just uh, wondering what a wonderful occasion caused you to buy such a dress. I attempted to teach my young ward proper means in America of uh, buying a lady's uh, clothing. Well, you see, in Portugal, we like to look good for any occasion. He pulled out an invitation to a flamenco show that was going on that night at his club. We were merely two streets down in little Portugal. Perhaps... If you feel like moving your body, you would like to come to my club. It has been many years since I have moved with rapidity, but my young ward moves like an angel. He's right. Yes, even though we serve the sangria, the little boy is welcome to come. Hmm, I wonder why Dr. General Chow would want to go there and what this all had to do with the dark corner where they stood, we'll find out after this brief word from Castilian Hairspray. Ladies, I'm Susan St. Peel, and it's no mystery why Castilian Hairspray is the only hairspray that a true lady should use. Why my hairdresser, Mr. Marcus is here to vouch for Castilian hairspray and all of its nurturing qualities. Yes, as a professional hairdresser, I find Castilian is the only spray that gives the bounce and vigor that a young lady likes in her hair today. Not to mention, it's fortified with vitamin H, the essential ingredient in hair. Miss St. Peel, will that man be your date tonight? Oh, no, I'm going out with the senator because my hair stays up all night long. <laughs> Just like the senator. Wow. <laughs> Telling me stories ab about the Senate. And what do you have to thank for that? <laughs> Thanks, Castilian Hairspray. Castilian Hairspray. Ladies or men, if you need something to stand up stiff in a tight breeze, or if something is flopping down repeatedly and you need it to stay up tight, just spray it all over with Castilian hairspray. It'll keep you hard as a rock. A rock of hair, that is. And now back to 
The Dark Corner. As General Chow was investigating Chinatown and neighboring little Portugal, Mark Shaw was getting into his vehicle driven by his driver to take him somewhere down into town. He was going to the Castilian flamenco ball that evening to see whether his time would be fun. We'll find out. Pango, open the door for me. Sure, I, I, I get it now. I get it now, boss. Now isn't soon enough. Here's a slap for you. Oh, oh, uh, the anticipation always makes it worse than, ow, ow, stop. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, boss. Now take me to 12th and Geary. 12th and Geary, I'm on it. I'm yes. late for the theater. And as they drove along the street, Mark Starr explained to his driver, how his riches were pouring in now that the competition in Chinatown was nil. Well, you see, as each shop closes down, yeah. the alternatives for where women can go to get their lovely, lovely, luscious dresses narrows. Yeah. So they have to come to me. Yeah. And pretty soon, when all of them are gone, they'll be merely mock star <laughs> boutiques everywhere. <laughs> Why, <laughs> this is no mystery at all. It seems like Mark Star is clearly behind it. Or is he? They pulled up to Chinatown, and he decided to go get some Peking duck from a neighboring restaurant where one General Chow was having a dinner alone. This a restaurant, a uh, real good view, boss. Uh, already reservation. Yes, I want my Mugu Guy pan. Excuse me, please. Could I have an extra face? Hey, not so close, mister. Now, Pango, be good. Oh. Well. Hello, sir. What a delightfully wispy mustache you have. Why, thank you. It has taken me many years to grow. Oh, allow me to look at that fabric, if you will. Yes, he held his hand onto the red silk gown that General Chow was wearing. He was amazed by the quality of the stitching. Fantastic. Why, it's quadruple knotted. Yes, the most difficult knot until scientists discover queen tuple knot, but that seems so unlikely. Uh, uh, and this inner pocket. Oh, my finger's stuck. Be careful. When you reach into a man's pocket, there is no telling what you will pull out or what you won't. And at that moment, General Chow makes some quick observations of the man in his own mind. Let's see. Man seems like a man, and yet his clothing is very effeminate. He dangles his cigarette and holds a pinky out as he smokes it. Mm, also, he has a small stain of cream around his ring finger, as if he is eating a dainty snack. Mm. He also noticed the monogrammed initials MS on his ring. Hmm. Could this be a famous... Mark Steinberg? <laughs> Maybe 20 years ago before I got into the business. Now it's Mark Starr. Ah, uh, yes. Mark Starr, I've seen many of your boutique. Lady walk in wearing a potato sack. Come out wearing a beautiful chiffon. Why, yes, I like to say that every afternoon another star is born. And at that moment, General Chow decided to interrogate the man about the sicknesses that were overcoming the dressmakers in competing boutiques. Hmm. Do me a favor, as a one gentleman to another, stick at the end of your finger into this small paper tube. Well, you don't have to ask me twice. Oh. Oh, we oh. caught. Yes, we seem to be stuck together, Mr. Star. Ah, the harder I pull, the tighter it gets. Oh, the Chinese most often secret. The Ma ancient Chinese secret. Ancient Chinese finger trap. What did General Chow have in store? Would they make strange bedfellows tonight? We'll find out. <laughs> Meanwhile, in a dark corner, around the corner from the dress shop, one Tony Mole was digging through a garbage can when he was approached by a beautiful Jessica Reseda. <laughs> she seemed panicked and worried. Hey, hey, what is it? Sneak it up on me. You there, you there. How long have you been out on this street? 
Well, I've been out on this street the whole time, my whole life, the whole generation, the whole shebang. Oh, thank heavens. Then you must have seen someone carting away my boxes, my entire inventory. It's all I had left in the world. It's gone. I just set them right here, and I turned my back for a moment to hey, lock hey, my hey, door. Slow it down. Oh, no, it's gone. Slow it down. He slapped her. <laughs> thank I don't, you. Sure. Sure, I don't like to do that to a lady I just met until I've gotten to know her pretty well. I, I'm... I'm sorry to, to just lay my life before you like that. What was I thinking? How at, in at that moment, she beckoned for more information, but Tony Moly wasn't giving it in so easily. Not for free, anyway. So, uh, you saw them? Or him? Or Sure, her? maybe I saw something. Maybe I didn't see something. Could you be more specific? Sure, maybe my hand stretched out like this says I saw something. But if my hand goes like this, I didn't see nothing. All I have left is five cents. Looks like I saw something. I was going to use that five cents to buy a loaf of bread. Hmm. Oh. Well, once I tell you this information that I saw somebody coming out that door right there, Mark 207, this afternoon might help you buy some bread. Were they tall? Tall, yeah. Uh, were they uh, uh, of ethnic descent? Uh, sure, ethnic descent. You know, black hair, dark skin, weird eyes. A Chinaman! Yeah, Chinaman. Hmm, this is dubious information from a dubious man. 207, why, that was the Portuguese dance club. Here, uh, I'm just going to have to duck in here and see if they'll give me a glass of water. Uh, Allow me to ask for a glass of water for you as well. Won't you come along? Sure, a glass of water sounds swell. And as the two of them go into that club, we'll find out what all of that means after this brief words from Lad's Gymnasium. Ugh, 25. <laughs> well, it's no mystery why Lad's Gym is one of the most popular places to work out in this San Francisco area. That's mighty fine, son. You're gonna make your old man proud when you enlist today. <laughs> well, as soon as I get myself big enough in the upper yeah. body area, I'm gonna head on down and sign up. Hey, did you fellas see these weights are made of real lead? <laughs> That's right. That's because it's a lad's gymnasium. It's not that concrete stuff they try to push over down on the south side. Why, those chemical formulas found in those lead weights will pump up those muscles faster than you could say movie of the week. Go ahead and take a grab of these. Oh, I don't make your country proud, son, and your old man. <laughs> Thanks, Lad's Gymnasium. Lad's Gymnasium. Yes, come on down to San Francisco's own Lad's Gymnasium. Come in the back door. It's always open. Lad's Gymnasium. And we'll find out the answer to the mystery of the dark corner after this very, very brief intermission. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. She came to Paris looking for a second chance. Simone is going out tonight. She got her best dress on and her hair pulled up tight. Simone in the city of the lights. She got her best game on and the whole world in her sights. All cat light up like schoolboys when she walks in the room. She's got Audrey Hepburn eyes. You can hear that heavy breathing. Get a whiff of her perfume. It should come as no surprise <laughs> Everyone thinks Simone's quite divine With a face and heart no artist can refine Simone, I'm half out of my mind One day you know I'm gonna make you mine Down on the boulevard in the corner cafe Y'all love Simone on the sidewalks, in the gardens of the Champs-Élysées, they can't leave that girl alone. Everyone thinks he 
In tonight's story, The Mystery of the Dark Corner, when we had left off, several people had died in a recent spat of dying Chinamen in the dark corner of San Francisco. Was it Mark Starr? Was it Jessica Reseda? What did Tony Moley have to offer? And what did General Chow and Dean Carter think about this? And what about Juan Jardidi? Let's find out as we peel back the curtain at the Jardidi Club, where General Chow meets up with Dean Carter. General Chow has a lot of information. Oh, General, I didn't think he would make it. Yes, of course, Dean Carter, I make it. I enjoy the enormous puffy sleeves on your samba shirt. Thank you. That man over there, Consuelo, has taught me a thing or two about the move. Yes, well, uh, Mark Starr taught me a thing or two about what is going on here in San Francisco. Dean noticed the half of the Chinese finger trap, meaning that someone had gotten away. Wait a minute. In your pocket there, the finger trap. Yes, but he was trapped long enough to tell me that many of his workers had been hired away by Miss Jessica Reseda. And, judging by his shoes, which were clearly from last season, his business has not increased its profitability. Wow. Perplexing. Not so perplexing after all. I think the entire answer to this mystery will be easily solved once the flamenco music starts. And just at that moment, two guests had walked in together through a back door. One Miss Reseda and Tony Mole. General Chow and Dean noticed them from a great distance on the other side. Hey, that's the girl from the dress shop. Yes, and I noticed her shoes. Very fashionable. 
Mm, not like the ones she was wearing earlier this afternoon. No, not at all. Yes, we heard Miss Reseda and Tony Moly talking while General Chow and Dean were in the distance. That's right. And every last one of them is gone. Oh, that's awful. That's awful. I, I, I don't understand how something like that could happen to a person. Seven dead people in, in a week? I know. I feel so responsible. I've had to contact their families. It's, it's horrible. Well, well, let's go ahead and have a little something to drink. Uh, hey, uh, uh... Oh, allow me, please. I'll, my last nickel for a whiskey for this fine gentleman, please. Hello, I am Consuela. How may I help you? A, wi a whiskey for this gentleman, please. And Consuelo <laughs> poured the whiskeys. Just at that moment, they were accosted by Mark Starr. General Chow watched carefully. Well, hello, my fellow dressmaker. How are oh! you? Mr. Starr. I know it's you who've been stealing away my workers, so maybe tonight I'll steal away your life. Yes, that is a 32 pistol you feel in your ribs. Oh, please, Mr. Starr. I didn't steal away your workers. They came to me of their own free will. You were cruel to them. They told me about it. Just at that moment, General Chow and Dean walked over. General Chow had a long, pointy stick with a barrel on the end of it. He pointed it menacingly. Yes, anyone who move gets a poke and then get what's in this barrel poured on top of them. Oh. And believe me, it's not good stuff. Uh, what gets? I have no interest in you, sir, except murder. <laughs> what? Yes, look at his collar, very closely. You'll notice a red smear on the left hand side. Not only that, it's cheap and garish. That you? Yes. It was the same state of the blood that matched on the door frame earlier this afternoon. Exactly, except this was not the blood, but in fact, cheap makeup used by a woman who attempts to appear older than she is. Isn't that right, Miss Orisida? Oh, all right. You're absolutely right. You caught me. I couldn't help it. I was poor. And you see, I have a son. And I needed the money. I had insurance policies on every single one of my workers and the building. Yes, so you lure them to your shop with the promises of easy work, having them make a less well-made garment than at the Marcus Star shop. So what if I did? Then you ensure them heavily and make sure they never stitch again. I lost five good seamstresses to you. They came from Shanghai. They were expensive. Oh, quit your griping. What you lost in workers, you made up in sales. Hey, uh, what gives here, Chow? Uh, what'd you call me down here for? Well, Inspector Williamson. That's right. Tony Moly wasn't a two-bit thief after all. He worked for the San Francisco Police Department. You can take off your mustache now, Detective Williams. Thank goodness. And your large red wig. Oh, finally. Also, your fake shoulder pads. Oh, these things were killing me. And that the false egg can also go. Oh. Don't forget those shoes that make him look like he has the gout. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you know what that does to a man with sciatic? I have him well, oftentimes worn it myself. You may arrest this murderess, Miss Jessica Reseda. I ain't going to Alcatraz, I tell you. I ain't going. And as he took him away, there's one question unanswered. What did Juan Jardidi have to do with this? I am Consuela. Also known as Juan. <laughs> you may put your mustache back on. You see, I like to wear the dresses. And the only way I can indulge my eccentricities is by hosting a club and serving beverages. And the only dressmaker in the town who would sell a women's dress to a man was a Jessica Rashida. Yes, I'm afraid I must go back to Portugal now. And with that, Jessica was seated, was taken away to the Sing Sing, where she would sing sing for the rest of her life. General Chow took Dean, 
by the shoulder and explain to him the end of the mystery. So everything is neatly wrapped up, Dean Carter. As usual. Yes. What have you learned this mystery? Well, I've learned that you just can't trust anybody, even if they wear lovely, beautiful garments. Especially if they wear beautiful garments and are a man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies but and gentlemen. This is San That's Francisco. another How often liquid. That happen? That's another Acme Radio Hour liquid radio production. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Good night.